Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome award-winning director Dream Hampton and Joan Morgan in conversation. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, I'm so happy for those of you who stayed. I know a lot of people had to leave. This is the last day of the festival. Congratulations to all of the filmmakers who had films in the festival. Yes. And thank you. And thank you, Joan, for um, Joan is ending her last day of her time, <laughs> her annual retreat on the vineyard, um, being in conversation with me, which may feel a little bit like work, but thank you so much. This is the legendary Joan Morgan who gave us the phrase. Yes. She, she gave us the phrase hip-hop feminist when we weren't quite... I knew I was a feminist. I, was a, I knew I was a black... Fe, well, I didn't always know I was a feminist, but, um, but yes. Hi, Joan. Hi, Dream. Can we give it up again for Dream Hampton? Um, so I'm going to ask some questions, but I want to say a few things first. Um, this film is such a testimony to the importance of archive, the prescience to know that while you are in the story, that there's something about the story that needs to be documented while you are living and creating the story at the same time. Um, I can't help but watch this film and think, my God, we were babies. And to have that sense and presence of mind even then that what all of us were doing was important and that would need to be contextualized one day blows me away. It really does and this is um, such a treasure. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so a little black backstory. How many, how long is this, um, when did you start documenting this? Because you weren't, when you started, you weren't, the intention wasn't this film. Right. right. So in 1993, I had a class at NYU, a documentary class. Um, I was to turn in a 45 minute project. I was like, oh great, I used to work at The Source for 18 months when I was 19, not a long time. Um, Folks always be like, Dream Hampton from the source. I'm like, I worked there for 18 months <laughs> when I was 19 years old. Um, anyway, so I thought I would go back to the office. My friend Kieran Mayo was still there. Um, the magazine had become a, a, a bigger deal. I had not yet re written my first feature for them, which was my Snoop feature. So even when I go out to interview Snoop, he's talking to me as, a, as an NYU filmmaker. So I it, it initially intentioned to do a piece about the Source magazine. The Source magazine kept kicking me out of the room when things got good. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, this isn't how you make a documentary, guys. And I was, Biggie was my neighbor and my really good friend. And I was like, he used to come to film class with me. Biggie used to... Um, Anyone go to um, film school in the in the room? So if you, Biggie used to come see like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari with me and Battleship Potemkin, and all these like <laughs> Russian films from like 1922. Um, anyway, so Big was my friend, and I was like, Yo, Big, I'm about to get an F in my documentary class because these source things keep kicking me out. And he was like, Okay, you know, just come shoot me, ma. And so that started. That So I don't know that I was prescient enough. For, a, I had a class. I mean, I'm glad it looks that way. And I am <laughs> proud of myself. There are times when I'm like, yo, I really kept the camera rolling. Like when at the very end when Kim is getting on stage and it, I had to go through a... I know something happens before that that's like more important. But I'm like, yo, I can't believe I got on stage <laughs> through these 30 dudes to get, you know, Kim's performance that night. Um... But yeah, it was really a class that I had and Biggie telling me to come shoot him. And so then that turned into me shooting other folks too. Um, we don't have long, so I'm, I'm gonna ask questions that people probably don't ask. Mm -hmm. I think that it's impossible really to know what I love that the film shows what it's like to be a woman um, trying to document the culture at that time 
and also to be living in the culture and loving the culture and being faced consistently with all of its um, contradictions. And that, you know, I mean, we love a thing that doesn't always love us back, right? And um, part of the thing about watching this film that becomes difficult is many of the things that you're saying, Kieran is saying, I'm saying, going, hello, this could be a problem. Guess what? Turned out to be major problems, right? Um, there are many people in the film who are not here anymore, who are gone, not just Biggie and Tupac. Like, just seeing Chi Modi's, um, Modu's face is like heartbreaking. And there are a number of people in the film who are not here. There are a number of people in the film who are legitimately brought up on charges for sexual assault, who we know have been violent. Um, Biggie's loved him, but you know, the rap rapist thing is chilling. Right? Chilling. Um, just even by who was in the film. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, not just what it was like to navigate those moments, but how do you think it informs the incredible body of work that you go on to do that actually, you know, I'm talking about su surviving R. Kelly in many ways, that sh not just shifts culture, but brings about the kind of awareness where we're able to see legal repercussions. Yeah, I mean, 22 and 23 year old Dreamy, I try to have grace for her. Like, I'm like, why are you giggling? Stay with the question, you know, like, um, but then also super proud of you for talking back, you know, which was like a book by Bell Hooks, just talking back, right? Which is very much in the tradition of being a black girl. Um, I stopped shooting this film in 95, Biggie gets murdered in 97. I don't, I, I don't, I didn't listen to hip hop after that. Like in 2000, Dead Prez came out with an album. Jay had a good album, the Black album. So I listened to like some records in 2000, but I don't, I stopped listening, you know? Um, you're talking about Puff, you're like alluding to Puff and deciding to keep him in the film was a decision, like to edit him out would be alive. I'm talking about Russell too. Russell. Okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> Russell sitting on the couch. I mean, Dr. Dre, I'm in the studio with Dre. By the way, our beloved Snoop, you know, Uncle Snoop, um, those years with Don Juan, he talked about pimping. He was selling women, right? Snoop is the only person in this film that um, is, is involved in a murder, credibly. You right. know, the whole Ethiopian family left Los Angeles after he performed murder as a case with a casket that was meant to symbolize their 20-year-old son. So um, it is all, it's, it's to, problematic is a euphemism, you know what I'm saying? So right. um, I don't look at hip hop as separate. I'm from the east side of Detroit. I'm from, I didn't, I raised my daughter here on the vineyard. I live here year round. Um, my daughter, who's a grown up now, did like first and second grade here at Tisbury. I have a great relationship with this island, but summer was not a verb for me when I was a kid. Like I, my mother was a waitress, my father was a mechanic. My, I was invited here as a, living in New York. Um, I say all that to say I come from black, poor culture, working class culture, working poor culture. Um, in a city, Detroit, where I, this is an aside, but never felt like I had to choose the coast, which is why you see me going back and forth mm -hmm. with kind of ease. Also proud of that dreamy. So the things that are pathologized and that are truly violent and harmful and abusive in our communities, I don't need celebrity or even hip hop to, you know, I don't think there's a hip hop culture. I think that culture has food. I think that hip hop is a genre of music in a black musical cultural tradition that has often been about resistance. But one of the things that Trisha Rose, I, I say this often, you know, I was on a panel with her in London and I was with Michael Eric Dyson and he had us arguing for hip hop. She was on the against side and she won the whole debate when she said that hip hop has become the cultural arm of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was all a dream. The title is about like who we think we're gonna be when we're young. You know, Absolutely. and this isn't just us. They're Black Panthers selling you barbecue sauce or running as Republican <laughs> candidates. And, you know, this is what happens, right? Like part of it is, you know, Snoop will sell us pool cleaning equipment, a car battery, whatever. I don't know, like anything with a QR code. And that's 
Okay, right? But it's what it is. It's not who I thought. Like that little boy who, that, that, he, he was a young man, but that young, shy Snoop yes. who, was, who didn't have a hit, um, who was talking about paying 50 cents to get into a park, right? Like, I want to hug that boy still, right? Yes. And, and, you know, and so these are like men and other people, you know, who may have disappointed us, but there was a time in this golden kind of amber um, that these were my friends, and I, I didn't know Snoop or Meth well. Me and Biggie were friends. Biggie, you know, um, Biggie was a good friend. Um, everyone else, I'm just kind of on a journey knowing. Sometimes they know me as a journalist. Sometimes it's just as a filmmaker it, because it's a two-year period. Right. So my, like, kind of profile as a journalist will raise in that period. Um, but more than that, I was a peer, and I was someone who could talk. There are other privileges. There's pretty privilege. There, you sabotage that when you talk, though. The whole the deal with being like pretty is to be silent, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so I was always yapping. Um, sometimes just about where do we eat at? <laughs> it's so embarrassing to be looking at your younger self. But I kept getting that note to put more of myself in it, and I understood it. And it was true that I was on camera a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Um. Should we take some questions? Yeah. Okay. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, I don't hang out slides. And I hang okay. <laughs> Do you want to? Sure. Okay. Oh, Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi, Amy. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> Just such a gift to have been um, to the culture. Thank you. Thank you. What really amazes me, uh, what really amazes me, and you touched on it, is the importance of archiving. I mean, here at that age, while you were in a class, yeah. you still kept all your footage. When I think of things that I've thrown away, <laughs> you know, because I'm downsizing and whatever, and you did all of this, I, it just blows my mind. And it's just so, so important. It's as though you had a crystal ball that this was going to be something very, very important. And your young self was really um, brilliant. I mean, I'm not trying to fill your head, but that, it's, that was really, really something. How, how, how did you get into the films? Um, was, did you have an assistant with you? Um, and also, where did you store all of this material? Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, so there are times, we were tiny crews. Um, Joan actually <laughs> was once an actor in one of my film shorts <laughs> at school at NYU. Um, and who knows where that canister of film is. <laughs> Amir Lewis, who is my producer, um, he's up here often too. His wife is um, Denise Lewis, who works for PBS and Black Public Media, if any of you know her. She's wonderful. Amir had graduated from Hampton and was a New Yorker and used to hang around NYU. And he edited my first film, which starred Anjanou Ellis um, back in 2001, I Am Ali. So this was a full circle moment for us. Um, he's now a professor at NYU. So there were times when Amir would shoot. So like if I'm in the studio with Biggie and I'm not shooting Biggie, that's Amir shooting us. Um, so Amir is who he gets the co-executive, I mean the, um, the producer credit on this film. Um, so that was a total full circle moment. The degradation that you see, particularly in the um, Snoop footage, is a result of me not always having it in climate controlled spaces. So I wasn't um, as, I wasn't as, you know, I wish I'd guarded the archive a little bit better. It's actually a lesson to you. I mean, I, thank God that 30 years later, my daughter's about to move across country. We're downsizing a storage space. And I, it's not like I didn't know the footage was there. I just hadn't looked at the tapes in so long. And when I saw stuff like that said guru, I was like, yo, I shot Keith. I forgot that. Yeah. Um, and of course I wanted to see him again. Um, you know, he's been gone for decades, and I was like, I get to hear Keith's voice, his speaking voice again. He was my neighbor. He lived on Clinton Avenue when I had a short haircut. He used to cut my Caesar. He was like a barber. Um, but anyway, um, so thank you, Amy. Raquel, did you have a question? or? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, it was someone next to Raquel. Okay. Um, wherever you want to take the mic, it's yet. Um, my name's Wendy Creedle. I'm an entertainer. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> 
Question. Um, I know you said you don't listen to hip hop anymore. So I don't know if you can answer this question, but if you had a message for the women in hip hop today, what would it be? You know, I don't have anything to tell them. They're killing it. You know, last year we were here. I mean, well, I mean, I have some very like doomsday messages. I'm sure you do too. Y'all are both OGs and, and, and Wendy, of course. Um, you were around for so much and I was too. And I haven't seen this end well for female performers. I will say that, you know? Um, but I, I would say that about the men too. I mean, I've never, um, I was never in the music industry, but I'm being, I, I've witnessed it up close and it's one of the most legally exploitive, contractually exploitive relationships you can have in this country. You know, one of the last ones, I had an attorney tell me that once. Um, even in film and TV, you know, we have unions and, and different kind of protections in order. We have friggin' healthcare and stuff. Like, I mean, what an exposed group of folks and hip hop, all the other identities just compounds that. So there's that, right? There's the whole thing of, of all these stories that are like, and you don't have to go back generations, though you could. You could just start with hip hop and look at where folks are. Um, but, you know, the, in terms of last year, we had a project here, Ladies First. It's still a Netflix series, um, a four-part series that we did on women in hip hop. And we did it because in this moment, even from my like detached space, I can see that there's nothing more interesting in hip hop right now than the women, that the women are the most interesting thing in hip hop in terms of the artists. Um, you know, in terms of protecting yourself, I would say the same thing if you were uh, someone who attended the black church regularly. You know, if you're talking about predators, I didn't learn that, you know, bitches ain't shit but hoes and tricks from Snoop. I learned that from the book of Genesis. So I, I think that that's why I don't like to talk about like, oh, hip hop or even, you know, the black poor working, working poor culture that I come from that again gets pathologized in all these ways and we we'll call it hip hop to be critical of it, which is true and accurate in terms of it being a genre of music. Um, but my generation didn't kind of invent the kind of abusiveness of women that we witnessed. But it, it was my generation's job to talk back to that, to be disruptive, to be, um, and, and I did it better on pen and paper sometimes than in person. Um, but that's always hard to like confront people. So I'm trying to have grace, you know. But yeah. Hi, my name is Tishira, um, and I've been a big fan of both of your work for a long time, so thank you thank for you. all that you do. I've been thinking a lot lately about collective joy and also collective trauma and sadness and how we can hold space for both simultaneously. So I want to ask you, how is your heart, especially after putting together something as dynamic as this? What brings you joy these days? What makes you hopeful? And also, what is a burden or a challenge that you see that you might be carrying? And can we lighten the load? <laughs> That's so sweet. That was a, a, a long quiet, and I know folks got to get home and go to the after party, so I'll let that be the last one. Yeah, I hear you on the project of, of, of holding joy and trauma simultaneously, not denying the other. Sometimes I, sometimes I talk about the Black Joy Mafia, because now it's like, especially now that Kamala has taken that on, it's like, joy, <laughs> you better be joyful. I'm like, I feel blue today. Um, but, you know, and so the sadness, like you were saying, Joan, about like the boss died, you know, after having um, this campaign, again, no health care, systemic. Um, violence against her black female body, um, not being able to pay for the chronic illness that she had, dying from it too early. There was a campaign, an online campaign, to save her life. That didn't happen. I'm talking about the boss, the MC that's featured in the film. Um, my joy is communing with nature. Um, the thing that drew me to this island where I found, when I was in New York, I, I went in 12th grade from Detroit, the student class went to a trip to Florida, and I went to New York to check out NYU and I went to Washington Square Park and I was like, wow, I feel powerful. Like I felt in my power. And the first time I came here with my newborn in 1996, I came across the ferry and I just felt decompressed instantly. I know a lot of y'all have felt this. I felt in my peace. So choosing to live here is my peace, you know? Um, and I, the last question, oh, what y'all can do. Just thank you for your attention today and just, you know, um, 
you know, read a black feminist, uh, <laughs> quote a black feminist, cite a black feminist, love a black feminist. Thank y'all. Thank you. <laughs> oh, pay a black feminist too. <laughs> pay a black.